Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming today. We survived two weeks of storms, snow, flooding, and here we are in beautiful Los Angeles. So thank you for coming. My name is Gaspar Rivera Salgado, and I'm the director of the Center for uh, Mexican Studies here at UCLA. Uh, we're gonna be transmitting, broadcasting this event via uh, Zoom and Facebook. So I just want to alert you that there's a very good sound system. So any comment that you make will be broadcasted and recorded. So uh, just I wanted you to uh, make aware of that. First of all, let me start with a lunch, uh, lunch acknowledgement. The Center for Mexican Studies at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tonga people. Um, I want to thank also our uh, colleagues here at UCLA that um, uh, uh, are co-sponsoring this event. Thank you for the support. This is, uh, includes the Latin American Institute, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment, and the Program on Caribbean Studies. So this has been a collective effort. And it's really my great pleasure to welcome a very special guest speaker today. Uh, Juan Villoro does not need an introduction. He's a very engaged public intellectual. Um, he is one of the most prominent intellectuals, intellectual voices in contemporary Mexico. And I would say now that he's one of the country's most prolific um, uh, writers, he's a prize winning author, playwright, journalist, and a screenwriter. And above all, an engaged public intellectual he re regularly writes columns in newspapers. Views. I was um, monitoring El País uh, during December, where Juan Villoro was had a weekly column during the World Cup, actually, <laughs> uh, uh, engaged in a, a transatlantic dialogue about the World Cup. Just one of the many examples of how he's engaged. His books have been translated into multiple languages. Several of his books have appeared in English, including his celebrated 2016 essay collection on soccer uh, brought out by uh, Restless Book, God is Round. Among his long list of publications include the novels El Disparo de Argon, El Testigo, and Arrecife. Also, his essays and chronicle books include Efectos Personales, Espejo Retrovisor, and Safari Accidental. His book, El Vertigo Horizontal, has just been translated into in English as The Horizontal Vertigo by Pantheon Books. Uh, Villoro, as he's popularly known, lives in Mexico City and has been a visiting lecturer at Yale, Princeton, and Stanford University. In today's presentation, Juan Villoro's uh, presentation is titled Understanding Current Mexico, the Grammar of Violence Villoro will reflect about current Mexico's historical moment in which the country is suffering from its worst outbreak and sustained violence since 1910 revolution. Please help me welcome Juan Villoro to UCLA. Welcome, Juan. Thank you so much, Gaspar. Sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, I thank everybody who made possible this venue and um, Professor Gaspar Rivera asked me to address um, an instrumental issue to understand uh, current Mexico, which is violence. We the Mexicans and Americans, we share a um, dreadful situation, which is drug smuggling and the violence related to this uh, tragedy. Um, although we share these problems, we have to say that most of the narratives that try to explain the issue tend to uh, consider that the only responsible uh, factor is the Mexican corruption and the Mexican drug lords. And I think that since we share this problem, we have to investigate both sides of uh, the frontier of the border. 
um, I, I would say that there is a kind of narrative embargo in the United States that prevents uh, people to find a solution to this narrative inside the American territory. So I think that these kind of talks are uh, contributing to understand a problem which is a bi-national one. Uh, I am going to read excerpts from a paper, a long, a very long paper I wrote on this issue, um, the grammar of violence. Mexico is suffering from its worst outbreak of sustained violence since the 1910 revolution. And yet the political establishment has turned hiding that truth into a fine art form. In his first uh, government report in September 2019, current uh, president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, dedicated just 40 seconds to the issue, as it was not important. His stance hasn't changed in subsequently years, and those who are covering it properly are paying for it with their lives. In 2022, 15 journalists were murdered. Those journalists were in the front line. And uh, through these uh, reflections, I want to pay homage to them. The Chilean journalist, Monica Gonzalez, has pointed out that the problem of violence in Latin America goes much further than drug trafficking. Organized crime is a far larger phenomenon encompassing the cartels, but also more powerful uh, and also more sectors of the economy and government. Today, the business elites are more powerful than presidents, even in countries supposedly governed by left-wing administrations, such as Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. And these elites aren't above indulging in illegality, whether it's putting their money in tax havens or simply laundering it. In Mexico, organized crime controls at least 10% of the money in circulation, which is amazing, 10%, a portion that can only be compared to the oil industry or the money sent back from the United States by migrants, and effectively uh, governs sizable areas that no lo and affects uh, gov uh, sizable areas that no longer fall under the auspices of the states. In addition to clearly illegal activities, such as banditry, kidnapping, human and drug trafficking, fuel smuggling, and extorting illegal fees for the use of the land, the portfolio of organized crime includes loans, the export of agricultural goods, mining, and clientelist distribution of food supplies and medicines. National sovereignty is relative, as it was shown by the journalist for El País, Jacobo Garcia, in 2019 in his journey through Tierra Caliente in the state of Michoacán, where 70% of the world's avocados are grown. By the way, in the last uh, Super Bowl, there was an amount, a huge amount of uh, Mexican avocados consumed in the state. Uh, the road of death is called this 20-mile uh, stretch in Michoacán, um, close to the border to the state of Jalisco. Uh, Jacobo Garcia was, has been covering war zones in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And he says that this uh, road of death resembles the war territory of those countries. Mexico is falling apart and lacks a security policy to address the situation. President López Obrador brought an end to previous failed practices which favored an exclusively 
a military approach under great pressure from the United States. And the former president of Mexico, well, two administrations ago, um, uh, Felipe Calderón was in charge and he signed uh, an agreement with the United States, the Merida Initiative, that resembled the Plan Colombia, which is, was an agreement to receive military aid from the United States. So um, uh, López Obrador said, uh, this is not um, uh, useful anymore. We have uh, uh, to take uh, another attitude towards uh, drug trafficking. Uh, military solutions are not enough. And uh, he addressed the issue in a promising way, but then he um, changed almost nothing about um, the struggle against the drugs. The current president, which is uh, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, aroused uh, out of an anti-military left-wing social movement. He ran for president three times, winning on his third attempt. On each of these campaigns, he promised that the army would return to its barracks. However, that isn't so easy. The army has become an independent power in its own right. When the Argentine writer Tomás Eloy Martínez interviewed Juan Domingo Perón, the general who was a very popular president of Argentina and was at the time in exile in Madrid, the writer asked him uh, that why, as a soldier, he hadn't called up the army at some crucial moments. The general answered with a maxim. The problem wasn't getting soldiers out onto the streets. It was returning them to the barracks. Ever since Felipe Calderón began his war on drugs in 2006, Mexico has been subjected to a military occupation that has only increased the violence and damage suffered by the civilian population. What can be done when troops patrol the streets without offering security? In June 2019, following pressure from Donald Trump, the newly created National Guard committed to detaining Mexican and Central American migrants seeking to go to the United States. Trump threatened to increase taxes on Mexican exports by 5%, which would have been terrible for an economy that, according to Statista Research Department, sends 79% of its output to the United States. To avoid an economic shock, the López Obrador administration acceded to the migration demands, and so the National Guard became an extension of the U.S. Border Patrol. In, in 2016, during his presidential campaign, Donald Trump claimed that Mexico would pay to build a wall on the border. Once in the White House, he found a perverse way of making good his promise. The Mexican army would become a wall that spanned the distance between Central America and the Rio Bravo. Getting back to the issue at hand, the army is in the streets and resisting going back into the barracks. López Obrador has admitted he had to change his posture given the present balance of power. Instead of bringing the army under control, he sought to assign it to other areas, giving it much more of a presence in society. The country now finds itself at the following crossroads. Is the military being civilized or is civil society becoming militarized? It's not a bad thing, it's not a bad thing that the National Guard is involved in construction projects, restoring some of the country's artistic heritage or helping victims and supervising security hotspots. But what are the limits to its power? The question grew more urgent in September 2022 when the Guacamaya Collective, which investigates military forces in Latin America, released a report. 
Of the 10 terabytes released, six were related to Mexico, a huge majority. Of course, one must handle information that could be plagued with inaccuracies uh, with care. And it's also worth remembering that spies tell lies. Uh, Graham Greene wrote a masterpiece on this subject, Our Man in Havana, in which a spy um, is forced to send some reports and he starts to write fiction. Spies also write fictions. Anyway, the Wakamaya reports have um, shown some very concerning issues about the military forces in Mexico. There is no doubt that the army is becoming more powerful in my country. Its political, its political sway is clear. A few months ago, orders to arrest 12 soldiers linked to the disappearances of 43 students in the Achotzinapa Rural School were canceled and the head of the Ministry of Defense, General Luis Crescencio Sandoval, refused to appear before uh, Congress for a hearing to discuss the issue. Later, he also refused to meet with representatives who um, were offered to visit him at his office. These acts put the general above our constitution. Soon, the army will take charge of customs and airline and some hotels at the Yucatan Peninsula. The constitutional reform currently underway will expand the presence of the army on the streets until 2029. Does it make sense to empower the troops in this manner when we don't know which government will rule in the next few years? Again and again, the president has betrayed the progressive ideals he claimed to represent and instead acted like a messianic strongman. His arbitrary exercise of power has not helped the poor he claims to support. In the current state of structural disorder, the three major beneficiaries of this government, of his government, have been multi millionaires, organized crime, and the army. During his morning tirades, Lopez Obrador accuses anyone who questions his policies of being a conservative, including those further to the left than he is. But there's nothing more conservative than being beholden to the army. At the dawn of modern German militarism, there was a saying, Prussia isn't a country with an army, it's an army with a country. Mexico's future would appear to be coming not in great strides, but to the beat of a parade drum, a tower of skulls. I would like to make a contrast between uh, the current violence in Mexico and uh, the ancient sacrifices of the Aztecs in pre-Hispanic times. While Mexico is becoming militarized, archaeologists are working to excavate the remains of the Aztec empire, which offer evidence of violence from long ago, including the notorious Zompantli, a palisade, a gigantic palisade made from the skulls of sacrificed victims. Mexico City has another city lying underneath it. From the Mexica codices and accounts from friars and conquistadores, archaeologists know of the existence of unexplored sites. Over 20 years ago, while I was working on a piece about the capital, experts in urban archaeology told me that they were expecting a lot from the street Republica de Guatemala because it ran along the sacred 
root of the death, beginning with the court uh, of the Aztec ball game in which either the winner or loser, whoever was best, best treated for uh, sacrifice, was offered up to the gods. However, excavation was hindered by the fact that the treasure lay underneath colonial era buildings that could not be demolished. Occasionally, earthquakes help archaeologists out. Guatemala Street has revealed its secrets thanks to collapses and cracks that opened up during the last two earthquakes. In 2015, an extremely important vestige of ancient Mexicans, Mexicans' peculiar relationship with death was discovered, a sompantli, an immense altar made out of skulls. At number 24 of Calle Guatemala, the base of a tower of skulls dedicated to Huitzilopochtli, the god of sun and war, was discovered. In October 2016, the archaeologist Raul Barrera took charge of the work at 24 Guatemala Street. 24 Guatemala Street. The site has not yet been open to the public, but I was able to visit it on uh, November 2017 two months after the earthquake that had knocked down several buildings in the city. Wooden cross beams held up the walls. According to Barrera, most of those sacrificed were prisoners of war, but they also included Spanish skulls. The most important discovery has been that 20% of the skulls belong to women and 10% to children. In the sacrificial, eco sacrificial economy of the Aztecs, whose goal was to appease capricious gods, one had to make offerings, offerings of prisoners, but also give up one, one's nearest and dearest. You couldn't be more wrong to think that the ancient Mexicans behaved this way out of disdain for life. To the contrary, it was extremely precious to them the only thing able to pacify the anger of the god. The sacrifices would only work if they were meant to be suffered. The tower of decomposing skulls, almost five meters in that diameter, emphasizes the political and religious power of Tenochtitlan, the ancient city of the Aztecs. It was a stage surrounded by a city of 200,000 inhabitants. Confronted with this incredible relationship with death, it's important to remember what Georges Dumessil wrote about the oddities of the past, interpreting archaic religious events in proper context means putting to one side the misleading barbarities one learns about at school. In his book, Death Among the Mexica, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, the archeologist uh, who discovered uh, the, big, the major temple in Mexico City, interprets the Sompantli thus. I quote Matos Moctezuma. The gods, sometimes belligerent, sometimes benevolent, had to receive sacrifices of different kinds in order to play their roles with the within the structure of the universe. One of man's most valued possessions is their life. So the sacrifice of that life ensures to a great degree the continuation of the processes that make life possible. Sacrifice was a prayer. You fed the sun so it would keep on shining. At Calle Guatemala, the earth is still damp from the lagoon that was buried to build Mexico City. Here, the air has grown thicker with time and the skulls make the present even more eerie. The world of Aztec sacrifice, which we found so strange, make us shiver the most surprising aspect of it, however, is that it can be 
understood that it can be decoded. The same cannot be said of our time. In comparison to the Aztec cosmology, contemporary Mexico seems even more absurd. How can we explain a country of secret graves, over 2,000 of which have been uncovered in the past 14 years, where death is little more than a byproduct of plunder? Let's go back to this dreadful present. 150 shots in three minutes. On uh, the, the 26th of June, 2020, at 7.35 in the morning, a van blocked the avenue Paseo de la Reforma, which is in the middle of, of Mexico City, and 28 assassins shot up the car of Omar Garcia Harfush, the Secretary of Citizens Security. The head of the Mexico City Police was traveling with two bodyguards who were killed in the fusillade, as was a passing street spender. Garcia Harfush survived thanks to the vehicle's level five armor. Three hours after the attack, he wrote on Twitter, this morning we were victims of a cowardly attack by Cartel Jalisco New Generation. I was hit by three bullets and several pieces of shrap shrapnel. The attackers were repelled by four bodyguards traveling in another car that was out of the line of fire and by police who arrived a minute later. 21 suspects were arrested and 14 of them charged. The attack was a notable failure. However, what was struck in the mind wasn't the incompetence of the shooters of more than 150 bullets, but of which, all of which missed their target, but the spectacular nature of the operation, its daring theatricality. The priority wasn't to kill, but to show that this was possible right in the heart of the Mexican capital. Drug traffickers have been visibly flexing their power while the government withdraws. Lopez Obrador began his administration with appeals to the morality of the kingpins. He asked them to think of their families, their mothers, their mamacitas, urging them to dispense hawks, not bullets, and use an infantile expression of disgust, Fuji Gaka. Meanwhile, the murders increased. The BBC reported that in 2019, 34,582 criminal homicides were committed, which is 20, uh, uh, I'm sorry, almost 3% more than in 2018. Already the bloodiest year in our recent uh, history. The armed peace. Admirably, Lopez Obrador called for an end of the war on drugs policies that the conservative president Felipe Calderón had initiated, uh, had imitated from the Nixon administration and from Plan Colombia. The policy was declared by Calderón in December 2006, two weeks after his administration began, while the opposition was still questioning the election results. Calderon explained his decision thus, two weeks after taking power, he encountered, that was his expression, he encountered a problem he hadn't foreseen so, uh, and so turned to the army. The or underlying causes would appear to have been quite different. The conservative politician was perfectly aware of the country's security problems. However, he couldn't promise to use the armed forces during his campaign. He refrained to talk about this issue. Once he was president, he didn't send a bill to, the, to be considered by Congress or bring up the issue with his party. The war on drugs was a personal impulse designed to change the public 
conversation. While tens of thousands were calling for a revision of the electoral proceedings, the thanks took to the streets and suddenly it was all anyone could talk about. There was no consensus for the mobilization of the army and it was, uh, and surely this decision was premature. Calderon was facing an enemy of unknown strength whose tentacles already reached into the government itself with no conception of uh, where the front lines or a rear guard might be. Six years later, 100,000 had been confirmed dead and 30,000 more had disappeared, the kind of figures one sees in a civil war. Consequently, the Partido Acción Nacional, uh, the, the party of Felipe Calderón, came in third in the next elections. A few days ago, Genaro Garcia Luna, who was in charge of national security during Felipe Calderón's tenure, was found guilty for uh, corruption crimes by an American court. Throughout his administration, Felipe Calderón insisted that the increase in violence was due to the fact that the cartels were fighting among each other. Uh, they were searching for new territories, and he described the narcos as evil doers, the malosos, strangers that had latched on to the community, unable to see that they were part of the social fabric. Uh, Calderon treated <laughs> the enemy as they were foreign people that came to Mexico, aliens in, uh, in a new territory for them and he refused to acknowledge that they uh, were part of our social fabric. The discourse of uh, Calderon's government, which was generally repeated by the media, which this has been a sad factor because the media has been the echo of a false explanation of the war on drugs. Uh, and thus, uh, the official discourse and uh, most of the media constructed a fiction in which the criminals formed part of an anti-society committed to annihilating itself, while inadvertently causing collateral damage to the civil population. The solution to this multifaceted problem uh, with its different social factors and diplomatic, cultural, political, religious, and public health related nuances could never be solely military. Trying to fight fire with fire would only ever result in one thing, for every Mexican to become potential collateral damage. Frustration over the bloodshed meant that in the 22 elections, the country decided to bring back the PRI, uh, the antiquated party that had been in power for 71 years, from 1929 uh, till 2000, yeah, and whose uh, only gesture towards modernization was the fact that its candidate, Enrique Peña Nieto, looked better on TV that he did in reality. Near my home, a line of graffiti explained rather succinctly why the anti-heroes of Mexican politics were back in 2012. Out with the incompetent and in with the corrupt. From 2012 onward, the official discourse shifted where Calderon made the military the center of his government and posed for photographs wearing, wearing a uniform far too big for him, not unlike the responsibility, pardon, uh, uh, Peña Nieto, on the contrary, believed that the violence was an issue of perception and merely of perception that could be improved if it wasn't mentioned. López Obrador doesn't belong to the kleptocracy. Uh, 
previous modes of politics. However, that's not enough for success. His alliance with evangelists and the most powerful business people in the country, his disdain for the middle classes, his support for fossil fuels, determined uh, um, and <clears throat> for fossil fuels, he refused to deal with the claims of the original uh, peoples. All these made uh, uh, of Lopez Obrador a conservative populist who occasionally ventures into left wing's territory. His attacks on different sectors have been his has has seen his support eroded, but his social base is still broad, and his and this has allowed him to wield power in an authoritarian manner with little time for teamwork or the involvement of experts. Populism thrives on polarization. At his morning conferences, Lopez Obrador calls out his supposed foes and dissenting journalists by name. He has transformed critical judgment into betrayal of the motherland, ignoring the fact that some challenges can actually improve policies and that criticism can be useful for his government. In an environment where journalists are routinely murdered, the president of Mexico is questioning every truth he doesn't agree with. Sophocles in Sinaloa. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is the most notorious drug trafficker in Mexico and the world. This reputation has had a range of repercussions across different sectors of society. As an exemplary villain who has now been arrested, suspicion can fall exclusively on him. Guzman isn't well educated, doesn't speak English, and isn't very good with technology. But the media and official discourse assure us that he runs business in over 50 countries. It has been proved that he has committed many atrocities, but it is possible that others have been attributed to him to exonerate criminals still at large. So the government benefits from having arrested the man guilty of everything, and El Chapo rivals and partners accuse him of crimes that continue to be committed. In July 2019, Joaquin Guzman received a sentence of a severity that matches his crimes. Uh, life in prison plus 30 years, which he is currently serving in the most secure prison in the United States, the ADX Supermax in Colorado. Putting a head of evil, a kind of wizard of us who ruled an entire kingdom in prison has become a good pretext for ending the search for other guilty parties. There is no much point in getting rid of the leader of a criminal gang if it just keeps operating under another leader. This is a structural issue that can be solved simply by arresting iconic figures, but every now and then for publicity reasons and political interest. Shortly after El Chapo was sentenced on uh, October the 17th, 2019, his son Ovidio was arrested by anti-narcotics police in Culiacan at lunchtime. The Sinaloa cartel reacted with protests that saw 68 military vehicles riddled with bullet holes eight people killed, 16 wounded, 19 roadblocks, and a prison mutiny in which 45 inmates escaped. It was, uh, it was 32 degrees Celsius degrees in the capital of Sinaloa that day, but the fires made it hotter. In this incendiary climate, a narco negotiating the release of El Chapito, the son of El Chapo, addressed the military with haughty superiority. And he said, we talking to you politely, let him go and live and no one's going to do anything to you. Otherwise, you, you will get it up the ass. 
Under the pressure, López Obrador ordered the release of Ovidio Guzmán. Capturing a criminal can't be worth more than people's lives, he explained. The statement contrasts with that of Calderon's to justify his strategy. Uh, as Calderon uh, used to say, it will cost innocent life, but it's still worth proceeding. The failed arrest was dubbed Black Thursday or Culiacanazo. Although it was the lesser evil, there was no consensus about the news in a fractured country. Lopez Obrador appealed to the humanitarian side of justice, but to many, it was a show of weakness. The magazine Proceso ran a front page um, of uh, uh, one of, uh, of Ovid, uh, no, of uh, the narcs deeds. There was a, a car that was exploding, no, and the words "You are in charge." So the narcs were taking control over Sinaloa. Two thousand years ago, in Antigon, Sophocles contrasted humanitarian law with one's obligation to the state. Lopez Obrador prevented a massacre and released a powerful enemy. Public opinion, the modern version of the Greek chorus, decided that this was a gesture of surrender, similarly to the reaction in January 2020 to the president shaking the hand of El Chapo's mother while refusing to meet with the victims of violence led by the poet Javier Cicil. The president was booed by the chorus, but Athens backed him. His approval rating in October 2022 was 69%, according to Morning Consult. In the 2021 uh, elections, his party won the governorship of Sinaloa for the first time, showing that the political hopes awoken by the party Morena which is uh, Lopez Obrador's party, outshone the impact of the famous Culiacanas. Ovidio's arrest remained unfinished business until January 2023, when Culiacan suffered through another Black Thursday. El Chapo son was arrested again early in the morning on the outskirts of the city. The previous operation had failed because it had been carried out in the city center. But even so, the narcos bodyguards made their presence felt in the uh, unofficial civil war. 10 soldiers and 19 criminals were killed. About 20 blockades were set up around the city and the army's armored vehicles came under fire from uh, 50, 50 caliber artillery. The bullets even strafed a commercial Aeromexico flight, causing panic among the passengers. The battle took place on the eve of President Joe Biden's visit to Mexico, making Black Thursday, Thursday a kind of gift for 12th night. U.S. backyard, the TEA undercover. Every day, 2,000 weapons illegally enter Mexico, while 200 are decomized. The figures are, of course, approximate, but uh, they reflect the difficulty of monitoring the busiest border in the world. It's not easy to combat drug trafficking where, when you live next door to the largest consumer of drugs on the planet. The tense relationship between Mexico and the United States came to a dramatic head when in October 2000, uh, 2020, uh, the Los Angeles police arrested General Salvador Cienfuegos, former Secretary of Defense. Such a high profile Mexican official had never been arrested before. The arrest caused great controversy. Certain sectors entertained the hope that another country might step in to establish an order of which Mexico is incapable. Another country, in this case, being, of course, the United States. Now, many people think, let's the United States take uh, the, the rules of our uh, uh, 
security police. On December uh, 2022, Tim Golden, an experienced uh, and very accomplished journalist and winner of the Pulitzer Prize, published a long report on the investigation that led to the capture and subsequent release of General Cienfuegos. This was published by the New York Times under the title, The Cienfuegos Affair. The text is revealing for how detailed its information is and for the un unusual way in which the United States uh, treats its so-called backyard, Mexico. Tim Golden shadows members of the DEA, judges and prosecutors fighting uh, the war against drugs. He implicitly makes the assumption that in contrast to Mexican officials, the intentions of agents from his country are honorable, which seems dubious in an environment so awash with blood and money. Tim Golden offers an in-depth account of the work of the DEA on Mexican soil, but never seems to feel the need to clarify that this is an undercover and clandestine operation in a foreign country. When Calderon signed the Merida Initiative in 2007, for which the, his government received over $3,300 million along 19 years in military aid, $3,300 million, uh, Calderon agreed to adopt the United States strategy without achieving the tactical success that President Alvaro Uribe had enjoyed in Colombia with the Plan Colombia. Lopez Obrador canceled the Merida Initiative and changed uh, the relationship uh, towards the United States regarding security. He ordered, uh, he altered the Navy's relationship with its advisors from the USA. He ordered the closure of the sensitive investigation units in which Mexican agents operated under DEA supervision and rejected a range of plans for cooperation with the embassy. According to Tim Golden, this resulted in Matthew Donahue, the head of DEA uh, in the United States, and uh, no, in Mexico. Matthew Donahue was in charge of the DEA in Mexico, and he started an independent uh, policy uh, aside from the Mexican uh, government with the support re reluctantly at the beginning, subsequently more enthusiastic of Ambassador Christopher Landau, uh, who occupied the US embassy in Mexico between 2019 and 2021. The DEA thus wrecked political vengeance and acted with impunity on foreign soil, just justifying themselves with an argument that was hard to refute. The Mexican government was incapable of investigating itself, which is true, sadly true. Donahue identified 35 officials as potentially being involved with narcos. His evidence was based on intercepted messages from the mo from mobile phones. Um, it's a quite confusing um, uh, story because uh, it, it was, uh, all the evidence was built on um, uh, cell phones of, from people that when they were trying to be presented to the court were already dead. So maybe one, some of these uh, messages were doctored and that was not uh, solid uh, evidence. General Senfuegos, the former uh, chief of our national security, allegedly received bribes from the Nayarit uh, cartel. His way of life hadn't changed at all and he hadn't moved or purchased any more uh, properties. Um, Ambassador uh, Landau was surprised uh, about this and he 
um, asked the, the, the DEA, how can we suspect from somebody uh, who has no signs of being related to organized crime because uh, he has his same way of living and so on. And the answer was a fortune like that is easy to hide in Mexico. So they went on with this investigation. Shortly afterward, the Mexican Navy decimated uh, the Nayarit cartel. And so the case against Cienfuegos uh, was built on messages from some dead criminals, not a very solid basis, as I was uh, telling you. Uh, Donahue, the chief of uh, DEA in Mexico, knew that Lopez Obrador didn't allow extradictions, and so he took advantage of a vacation. The general went with his family to arrest him here at LA airport on October 2020. The chancellor of Mexico, Marcelo Ebrard, immediately spoke to the attorney general, William Barr, who claimed not to know anything about the affair and said, the EA agency is acting by itself in Mexico. And he also uh, spoke to Ambassador Christopher Landau, uh, um, uh, which, uh, who says, I've never seen Marcelo, which is our chancellor, so upset. Uh, Ebrard accused uh, Americans of operating in secret without the least respect for Mexico. Would you treat France this way, he demanded. The DEA had prepared an insubstantial 700 page brief that the Mexican government published after the general was freed to the humiliation of the agency, which was hoping to find decisive evidence a posteriori during the pretrial interrogations. For the DEA, it was dreadful that this um, unsubstantial account of 1,700 pages long was known by the public. Journalist Tim Golden, uh, he, Tim Golden's long article suggests rightly that there are too many loose ends in the fight against drugs, but it also portrays a hurried investigation whose motives could easily range from a genuine search of the truth to the desire of agents and public attorneys to further their careers with a high profile bust. The meaning of text can change depending on who is reading them. The Cienfuegos affair means something different to those of us who regard Mexico as a country rather than as a backyard. Golden provides compelling evidence of the United States invasive strategy and the firm stand taking in this instance by President Lopez Obrador and Chancellor Ebrard against excessive foreign intervention. None of this lifts suspicion about the complicity of high ranking military figures and uh, of public officials with drug trafficking in Mexico. Organized crime depends on that complicity. However, the dominant narrative generally assigns all the blame to Mexico, even though every police station in the United States has an internal affairs department. And even though we know very little about the police ties with crime here in the United States. But if they didn't exist, we surely wouldn't be describing the country as the biggest consumer of narcotics in the world. The DEA, the CIA, the FBI, and other agencies have very effectively institutionalized drug trafficking while, while focusing on avoiding its more violent repercussions. Simultaneously, they have created a discourse that identifies the origin of the problem as being located in Mexico, Colombia, and other countries. And so the corruption of American officials is shrouded in a blanket of silence. Even an article as wide ranging and well researched as Tim Golden's follows the moral compass established by that narrative. The stories are to be found in the South. 
the ones up north can't be told. The message of the bones. In 2010, Felipe Calderón ordered that the bones of the heroes of independence be exhumated so they could tour the country in a grand funeral procession. The remains of the founding fathers formed a mobile zompantli that well suited the hyper, hyper visibility of power sought by the conservative president in his war on drugs. Years later, in uh, his cam campaign rhetoric, Lopez Obrador loud, uh, laudably rejected this discourse, but he hasn't been able to keep his promise. Today, the army is larger and the strategy is weaker. According to the New York Times, the National Guard, which is three times the size of the defunct federal police, arrested 8,258 criminals in 2021, 30% of the arrests made in 2018. So they are just getting 30% of the criminals that they used to get before. Politics begins with words, but it must move on from them. Victor Hugo, the famous French writer, sent a letter to press Mexican President Benito Juarez, calling on him to spare the life of the usurper uh, Maximiliano, who was for a year, for some years, the emperor of Mexico. Let the violator of principles be saved by a principle. Let him have that joy and that shame, wrote Victor Hugo. The biggest offense one can cause to an adversary is not to be like him. If one is to combat violence, then they cannot exercise it in vain. The ethical strength of this position is clear, but it's not enough to pacify a country. In his rhetorical outbursts, López Obrador has not presented any concrete plans for restoring the social fabric. To a wide array of questions, he answers that he will act honestly, a principle very rarely observed by its predecess his predecessors, but it won't guarantee him control of the playing field. Let's go back to the ancient Mexicans. The pre-Hispanic world paid religious homage to the death. For warriors to fall in battle was an honor and a sacrifice to the demanding gods. However, at the same time, Poets of the Aztec world lamented this vassalhood in verses full of anguish and sadness over the fleeting nature of things. Like a samurai writing a haiku before committing harakiri, the Aztec poet both laments and accepts his inevitable fate. Dying is painful which is why the gods value the gesture. How can we compare these practices with the gratuitousness of death in contemporary Mexico? 2021 marked 500 years since the fall of Tenochtitlan, while archeologists were uncovering the skulls in the Zampanque. Images of these ceremonial pyres make shivers run, run down your spine. But as noted before, they, can, they have a clear religious motive. In contrast, the bones of the forefather, forefathers put on parade by Felipe Calderón weren't much more than a circus attraction. Today, Mexico is an immense necropolis seeded everywhere with contemporary skulls. We live, as the journalist Marcela Turati, who has investigated the issue in depth, puts it, in the country of 2,000 mass graves. Every relic has a reason to be. Is there meaning 
in any of this spilled blood. In the bloodiest era of our history, the voice of the Aztec poet resounds. On the earth that was loaned to us, nothing is so uncertain as life. Thank you very much. Si te quieres sentar este. Uh -huh. Pues vamos a. Me, me pongo aquí ya está. Si quieres, si quieres estar ahí, está bien. Como sea. ¿Cómo te gustaría? Sí. Okay, Como perfecto. sea. O oh, bueno, me paso para acá. Sí, tenemos, tenemos aquí la cámara. Okay. Excelente. Bueno, pues ahí está. Muchas ideas. Many, many ideas on the table. So we have some time to uh, engage in a discussion with one. So I'm gonna go around first in the room and then we'll go to those folks uh, watching. There were, there are 51 people watching on Zoom and Facebook Live. So we're gonna also have the opportunity to allow them ask questions. So why don't we start here in the room if there are any questions, comments, reactions, go ahead. All right. My compliments, first of all, and my felicitaciones. Thank you so much. Uh, a very beautiful lecture, despite its terrifying and horrible content. Uh, if everybody speaks Spanish, I can speak Spanish instead. See, si? muy bien. Pues. No. <laughs> you want me to speak in English? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, as I said, a beautiful lecture, despite the horror of the content. So my compliments. Um, and the, the, this uh, connection between our ancient world and the contemporary horrible violence might lead some ignorant, especially North Americans, I'm sorry, to, be, to believe that we are violent by nature, that Mexico cannot help what it does now because we are inherently culturally violent. Um, so that is something that uh, I, I always combat because every, I think every state Every state in its foundation is, is founded on violence, I think, you know, to protect its freedom, to protect its way of life. So somehow we have to combat this impression also that due to our ancient roots, uh, which was an empire, I think every empire uh, has an excuse of saving the uh, uh, victims or saving the, the, uh, the conquered. At any rate, we have to also combat this impression that we are violent by, by nature. Um, and I don't know how to do that, <laughs> except to point out the violence in other, in this country, in this country, which I love and I respect, and I am very uh, grateful to, uh, the sale of arms to Mexico is, is blamed a lot. And as you say, the market of the, the market of drugs. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can we, make other countries reflect on their responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yes, but thank you very much. Uh, hearing you, I, I was remembering uh, one of uh, um, uh, most uh, uh, famous sayings by uh, German philosopher uh, Walter Benjamin, who said that every statement of culture is at the same time a statement of violence, because uh, every civilization comes after another one that destroys. So um, uh, human history is this the history of um, uh, a continuous destruction. No? And by nature, well, we are predators and uh, we have this uh, capacity to destroy the environment and we are showing uh, this capacity in, in an extraordinary way um, especially in the last years. So each society has to deal with different forms of violence. I am uh, very fond of a British writer, J.G. Ballard. Uh, he was a sci-fi writer, but uh, Ballard said that uh, science fiction uh, belongs not to the future. It's already among us. And he was the author of a novel called Crash. Maybe you're familiarized with the film by David Cronenberg. Uh, and he has a couple of novels in which he reflects on uh, these uh, controlled environments in uh, the south of France, who are idyllic places in which uh, people refrain, refrain to exert any kind of uh, violence. 
they are gated communities with all the possible cultural attractions, uh, well-off people, uh, educated people. Uh, and uh, his uh, take is that if those societies exist, those um, uh, places inside society exist, isolated as perfect uh, examples of communities, uh, what happens to violence? And uh, of course, his hypothesis is that you need to create another kind of uh, violence to fight boredom and to fight this kind of steady life that uh, has nothing to do with human nature. So there's no nothing more um, far away from human that this kind of extremely peaceful situations. Of course, I am uh, re remembering this uh, conception of uh, violence by J.G. Ballard, uh, because of course it's a metaphor of what could happen in a perfect society. There are no perfect societies. Each kind of society is impure, and to a certain extent needs to uh, control and exert a uh, different challenges, um, violence can be a fight through sports, uh, through different kind of uh, communication and uh, uh, social associations and so on. But um, in, in the current situation between Mexico and uh, uh, the United States, I think uh, the, the, the most terrifying factor is that there are a lot of people um, uh, uh, doing business with this situation and do we really want to stop the drug trafficking it means 10 percent of our economy do we really want to stop that so many mexican officials they prefer to institutionalize the flow of drugs without the side effects which is the take that the dea has um, uh, take here in the united states it's not a drug prevention administration is a drug enforcement administration, EEA. So um, they, they are uh, addressing the issue in order to cope with uh, the violent side effects of drug trafficking, but not to prevent all of the, of the drug trafficking. And this is killing people here in America. So this is a social problem and an, an economic problem as well. So we do need another kind of approach to this problem because people are dying on both sides of the border. And I think it's very important to construct these kind of narratives. I was quoting this very important uh, Tim Golden um, uh, article, a uh, very long uh, investigation on the New York Times because it, it, it is uh, both um, uh, 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 rendering of the problem with all the statistics and all the people involved and so on and uh, it is not able to uh, understand that the DEA is acting under cover in a foreign country which is an invasion of Mexican sovereignty and this is uh, all, uh, this is a terrible fact so we, we need uh, other diplomatic uh, relationships and so on but this has been very difficult to construct and uh, is as difficult as, 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 as have a regulation of the illegal people, Mexican legal people here in the United States. And we live in a, an absurd situation. The, the jobs for these Mexicans are, are, are able here in the United States, but it's very difficult to uh, have papers for all the people involved with these jobs and so on. So uh, we have this structural problem and drugs um, are um, among one of our um, most uh, difficult issues to solve. And this has been important for presidents because the, fight, the war on drugs has been um, a political strategy that is, uh, has more to do with the official rhetoric than with reality. So how strong is a president? Well, it depends on how strong he shows uh, that he is. And so this sh showing muscle has been important, not to fight the real issues, but to 
give a strong image of the country. And um, in the meantime, people are being killed with no sense, with no purpose whatsoever. That's why I wanted to compare uh, this, uh, the, both the, the new archaeology uh, treasures that are being discovered in Mexico and that make you shiver because you see the skulls and you say, what kind of people were they? You know, uh, the, the founders of my city. But at the same time, that uh, very dreadful uh, signs of the past had a religious and cosmological purpose um, that we lack uh, in, the, in the present. You know? Thank you. Any other questions here in the room before we go to the yes. Yes. Um, I just have a question. So, as a political. Hey, can you speak a little bit louder because I have a hearing problem? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll get closer. Actually. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, to my ears. <laughs> uh, I guess I've, uh, I have a question as a political as a political uh, writer. What future do you see, um, especially with you know the the, the controversies that Ine, you know the increase of Sedena, um, and uh, like especially in you know a country that I would say has kind of become apathetic to mm -hmm. the violence, like. I remember this past summer, uh, there was explosions happening in Guadalajara, and I just went around my day like nothing. Uh, and most people just went around their day like nothing. So like at a certain point when violence becomes so uh, routine, mundane, what future do you see in like, you know, change, the possibility of change mm -hmm. um, for, for Mexico? Yeah. Um, you know, given the situation. Mm -hmm. Well, apathy is very rewarding because if you um, are not interested in the problems of your country, then you don't feel the urge to do something. So I, I tend to think that there, there is a kind of professional apathy. Uh, people, they, they, they force themselves not to do things. So in order to avoid any kind of responsibilities, and uh, but uh, on at the mean at, at the same time there are a lot of groups in Mexico growing and which are quite important um, um, uh, uh, the indigenous people um, uh, ecologists um, and the, uh, civil activists who are trying to understand uh, politics in a horizontal basis they are not trying to achieve power. They are not trying to found a party. They don't want to belong to the administration. They don't want the, uh, all the recompenses you can get by leading a political career. They want to change the country in a horizontal basis. I belong to a collective called Llegó uh, la Hora de los Pueblos, not the, the hour of the people have come and uh, we support uh, the struggles of the original people of Mexico. We have a website called Camino Alandar. Uh, and uh, this is one example of the many um, organizations that are trying to do something different. The movement for peace led by uh, the poet Javier Sicilia has been also very important. He came even to the United States, he marched from the Mexican border to Washington uh, to address uh, these issues and to connect with different peoples of uh, activists here in the United States. This has been very important as well and so on. But journalists are <laughs> under per peril, especially those who are on the front line in small newspapers in the province. Ecologists are under uh, peril as well. So. The situation has been very difficult for, for, for these uh, civil fighters, but uh, I mean, the struggle is going on. Now, um, the president is, is uh, fighting the INE, which is our national institute uh, who organized the elections. And this can be dreadful because it was very difficult to have 
uh, com uh, competitive uh, and uh, honest elections in Mexico. The first time I voted was in 1976, and there was just one candidate for the presidency because the opposition parties, they refused to present the candidate because it was a farce. So they say, how come can we have a candidate if we already win who is, who is going to, uh, we already know who is going to win, no? Um, a, a, a Mexican satirist, I quoted him yesterday, Jorge Guaguaycoita, wrote an article at the newspaper Excelsior that began, next Monday we have the elections. How exciting. Who is going to win? Uh, and there was just one candidate. No? So that was the democracy when I started off as a voter. No? And it was very difficult to have this institute that organizes uh, the elections. But the president wants to go back to the time in which the um, uh, uh, Secretaría de Gobernación, our uh, Ministry of the Interior, was um, being in charge of the election, so they could control all the proceedings. So it wasn't safe because the, the, the judge was part of the, the, the it was part of the government, and it, he wants. I, I'm putting it in a very simple way, uh, but uh, th that's. Uh, the, the let's say the last goal of, of the president, the, the end goal uh, while fighting the INE. And it, it has been astonishing how many people have involved themselves in defending this institution. Um, on the rule, you don't see people defending institutions, you tend to uh, see people defending causes, but not institutions. And this was, uh, this has been a, a major movement. Of course, at the same time, there are opportunist players, uh, po uh, professional politicians who want to profit uh, out of this situation. And they say, we are defending the uh, electoral uh, uh, institute and we are the ones that want democracy and so on. And we are with the people as, as usually uh, happens. No? But uh, I think the solution is to think of politics in a more civilian way, as civic activities, in a horizontal way, not in this vertical acquisition of power. No? And um, um, I'm confident enough that uh, in some respects this is going uh, to happen uh, because uh, laws are changing through the pressure of society and some things that uh, uh, were uh, that the, the, the government was doing with impunity some years ago now are impossible. And, uh, but uh, there are still, still very strong players. One of them, and I was talking about, is the army. Because the, the army is extremely powerful. And uh, there is a, a discussion, I know, inside the government, because some officials think the, the army is already too powerful because it received a lot of money from the United States, um, $3,300,000, no? uh, which is an amazing amount. And uh, they received this in 2008. That was the year of the economic crisis uh, all over the world. So in a time in which nobody was winning in the economy, there was a wealth of money in Mexico related to um, military purposes. And so, um, of course, through corruption, a lot of private security forces were founded and so on, but uh, the Darby became extremely powerful. So some people inside the government, government they say, since the, the, the army is already too powerful, the only solution is to put the power, the military, in charge of uh, civic activities. So that's why they are uh, in charge of customs or in charge of the airport or in charge of the construction venues. Now they are going to have an airline and uh, hotels and so on. But to what extent can you have this kind of inside power uh, that doesn't uh, 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 answers to nobody. I was quoting here the, the general in charge of our army. He refused to go to the Congress and he said, I don't, know, I don't have to go to the Congress. Then the deputy say, well, then we will go to your office and he, I, I refuse to receive you. So he's a side of any kind of obligation. 
and he has this extremely amount of power. This is going to last till the year 2029. We don't know uh, which party is going to rule the country and so on. So this is a very strong player, the military, and they are involved with drug tra trafficking as well. Not all the militaries, of course, but it, it is impossible to have that kind of, uh, that amount of drug trafficking without some um, officials knowing about it and being involved with the deeds. So um, uh, that's also a main problem, no? Um, the, the disappearance of 43 students in uh, Ayotzinapa, uh, they, they disappeared in the year 2014, uh, if I don't remember badly, and uh, th there has been no solution to this investigation because all the uh, questions led to the military in charge of the zone in Guerrero, and they refused to give declarations. They refused to give any kind of deposition. So um, it's impossible uh, to uh, know what happened, and uh, they can't be forced to uh, be accountable. And that's, uh, a, a, uh, I would say, that's a proof of what can happen in the future. So we have as good news, civic movements going on, and as bad news, a military power extremely um, uh, great, and also uh, the economy that depends very much so on, not directly on drug trafficking, but on the money involved on, uh, for some money laundering, no? Uh, it has no sense to receive money through uh, drug trafficking if you can't put this money back into the legal economy, because uh, what can you do with a, a room full of bills, no? Full of dollars. You have to put this back to the economy. So all this money goes back through hotels, um, through uh, sports, uh, and many, many venues and so on. And well, a lot of enterprises. So that's that's a, a problem as well. So you have the, the, the positive side and the flip side. No, the positive side is society fighting back, organizing itself. The, the flip side is the powerful factors that are still very much alive. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pose a couple of questions from the people online. And uh, one question from Signis Balfours. Uh, she says, thank you for an immensely interesting talk. Can you share your opinion on whether you agree with the term culture of violence to describe the Mexican case? Why yes or why not? Well, I think it's dangerous to think that violence is a cultural factor in Mexico. President Enrique Peña Nieto said that uh, a corruption was part of our culture. So that it's impossible to fight corruption because uh, it's a cultural fact. Uh, I think that all countries in the world can be corrupt if uh, if Switzerland could have the possibilities of being as corrupt as uh, Mexico and other countries, maybe Switzerland would be as corrupt as these countries. Uh, any kind of country it has a sort of corruption. I would say that for Mexicans, I, I, I would like to have the German corruption because there is corruption in Germany, but it's a much smaller corruption than the one we have. So um, uh, uh, any kind of society is able to corrupt itself. And at the same time, um, uh, human beings uh, belonging to a predator species are capable of violence. But um, I, I wouldn't say that you can speak about a culture of violence. You, you can address violence through culture, and you can understand in different ways violence through culture. And in, in, in this um, lecture, I try to compare no, the, the, the cultural uh, value of violence in the ancient Aztec world and uh, the uh, senseless violence of the current Mexico. So. Um, I wouldn't speak of a culture of violence. I, I would speak uh, through an understanding of violence through 
uh, culture. And when you began, when you start to speak about a culture of violence, then you give a alibi to people who say, well, we can cope with violence in Mexico because this belongs to, to culture. And mm -hmm. of, of course, uh, we have dreadful habits uh, uh, as any any kind of society has, and we have to fight these, these habits, and, but not uh, all habits belong to the cultural representations. A second question from uh, Maite Suyagurre, who is a professor here uh, in yes. Mexico City. And uh, she's saying, I'm interested in your thoughts as an engaged intellectual. How do you restore the social fabric of contemporary Mexico? How do, do, we, How do you restore we, we, we restore the social fabric mm -hmm. uh, in contemporary Mexico? Well, uh, this is a, a very interesting question and a all interesting question has no solution because uh, how, how can you, it's, it's very difficult to say what do we have to do to restore the social fabric. First of all, in Mexico, we have a terrible polarization of the social discourse. Uh, and um, in the last years, uh, populist governments have fostered uh, a polarization in social discourse, which is uh, uh, dreadful. Uh, I think that social media has been responsible for this as well, because in social media, you have always a bipolar situation in which you can give a like, or you can condemn somebody and go to, um, uh, to vote in uh, uh, change.org uh, and so on to condemn uh, a situation, a cause, etc. So um, uh, you, you have uh, an extreme uh, situation in which you like something or you hate something. And uh, uh, we are used to this kind of discourse in social media. And now the uh, political arena um, has the same problem because it's very difficult uh, to have a critical discussion and to say, I agree with some of the things that the president said, but I disagree with the other ones. For example, if somebody from Mexico is hearing my talk, he would disagree uh, strongly with me uh, in, uh, in some facts because uh, I criticize the president uh, for his uh, security policy and uh, for his populism and uh, his lack of uh, commi commitment uh, to address social issues. But at the same time, I said that he had a strong argument against the um, American intervention in recent years. So I was both criticizing him and praising to a certain extent his policies. Uh, and now I, I am in a tough spot in Mexico because this kind of attitude um, uh, it, it belongs to a minority. Um, nowadays, you have to hate everything the president does or you have to support everything the president does. And this polarization has been terrible because you can't achieve solutions through polarization. There are, uh, to restore the social fabric, we need complex situations and we need to accept that uh, when you are negotiating uh, in the political arena, you are going to uh, create a middle point in which you can uh, reach an agreement when, with the people that doesn't agree with you from the start. So you have to create consensus and creating consensus mean avoiding some of your thoughts in favor of the thoughts of the other. This kind of discussion has been impossible in recent years. And uh, I think uh, that's why uh, it has been so difficult to, to restore um, uh, the, the social fabric. So, uh, and, and this is a cultural challenge because uh, conversation, discussion, is one of the most important facts that we can have in society. I think universities have a responsibility about it, newspapers as well. But for example, if you read the Mexican press, you will find newspapers that belong more to propaganda than to journalism, uh, because they are either praising the president or uh, uh, criticizing the president. But there is no middle ground for discussion. There is no middle ground for intelligence in most of uh, the uh, uh, social media and the press and so on. So we have to construct this. 
and uh, to construct the reasons of the people uh, you don't agree with. And this is one of the uh, more, more important um, uh, facts of democracy, uh, to support the rights of the people who think in a different way. Uh, and and, and we, we have to fight for this. Uh, when Mexico was founded in the, 20th, the 19th century, most of the, um, uh, the politicians who were trying to invent this kind of country were writers. And they, they, they had a, a cultural responsibility. And these writers were trying to create laws uh, that would um, guarantee the uh, diversity of ideas and, uh, and that was the, the, the whole concept of having a new land after the uh, Spanish domain and uh, now we have to go back to these ideas of the uh, founding uh, intellectuals of our country people like Guillermo Prieto, Vicente Riva Palacio, Ignacio Manuel Altamirano who were um, journalists who were writers and uh, but who were trying uh, foremost to create a new country in which discussion was possible and in which um, a dissent was not regarded as a crime but was uh, but, uh, on the contrary was regarded as something important to create uh, new solutions because uh, nobody has all the solutions by himself. You have to find the solutions with people who at the first can be regarded by you as your adversaries. So I think this is uh, the cornerstone. This, this is the, the, the most important thing we have to fight right now to, to create a climate of discussion. And um, I, as a writer, feel a responsibility towards this, this goal. And afterwards, then we can discuss which are the multi-cultural uh, uh, factors that we have to change because uh, violence has not to do exclusively with committing crimes and fighting crimes with uh, police enforcement. It has to do with social factors, religious ones, and so on. Uh, nowadays, um, if you want to have a sense of belonging, if you're a poor guy and you want to have a sense of belonging, there is no better solution for you than to become a member of a narco gang, because there you can have quick money, you can have social prestige, you can have uh, um, uh, uh, iconic symbols of belonging, and what else do you need? And it's not that these people belong to the devil, um, they, they are human beings who find in a very reasonable way that the best solution, the emergency solution for their situation is belonging to a crime, a criminal organization. This is dreadful. So we have to fight this in a, in a similar way with all the multicultural factors involved. But first of all, we have to accept the reasons of the others and we have to accept cultural discussions and we, we have to accept to accept dissent which is very very difficult right now to accept let's have uh, we have time for two more questions so here and and in the back so go ahead i, I was wondering how do you see the role of education you know mm -hmm. you well the role of education is instrumental and uh, we have a lack of education in many uh, 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 regions of the country and um, it was uh, quite symbolic that these 43 students that disappeared they were meant to be uh, uh, teachers at rural schools and you know in the 30s they were over 20 rural schools some 30 rural schools at the time of the times of the general Lázaro Cárdenas in the 30s. Now we have less than 15 rural schools in a country that's much more bigger. So in the 30s, they said uh, uh, people have to go to the countries and we need education for the poorest. No? And uh, uh, it's no surprise that when these rural teachers go to the country, they see that their students live in a terrible situation. So they say, in order to study, these students have to change their life. So most of the teachers get involved 
in political activities. And they, um, and, uh, it's, it's a pattern. At, at the beginning, they try uh, in a, a civic way, they try to foster a civic movement and to uh, react through um, the uh, public policies and so on, but they um, receive no answer whatsoever. And some of them have turned uh, guerrilleros and uh, uh, this has been a, a circle uh, in, in, in Mexico. So education is one of the most important uh, factors to, to change the country. And uh, uh, on the long run, there is no political security as useful as education. Of course, uh, it takes much more time and it takes much more money uh, to prepare people. But if you have cultivated people with moral values, it is going to be more difficult for these people to become involved with criminal gangs. Uh, but the short term uh, solution has always been the military occupation and to fight violence with violence. And uh, uh, education plays a major role, but nowadays it has, it, it has become uh, one of the lesser uh, factors for political uh, policies, which is, is terrible. So uh, we need to, to change this. Uh, 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 that's, that's one of the, uh, of the main issues for the future. Let's close this with a question in the back. So thank you so much for the conversation. My question is regarding the drug traffic. So do you believe or consider that legalization of the drugs could be a way to avoid the violence in Mexico? And what factors uh, could be played against this mm -hmm. uh, legalization and why? Yes, well, that, that's, that's uh, also uh, a very, very important question. Uh, I'm not an expert. And in the public uh, conversation, we have to discuss this, this issue. I, I guess that there is very, very important to legalize some drugs. Marijuana, for example, should be legalized all over. And this is one of the factors that uh, can be important to achieve a certain goal. At the same time, there are uh, some drugs that are killing people like fentanyl, for example, which should be banned and should be avoided uh, in all possible ways. And then we have to discuss uh, if other kind of drugs uh, can be legalized. And also the use of chemical, chemical drugs, um, many of them that uh, were created to um, enhance uh, concentration for people, and they were created to, for neurological purposes. These drugs are being used by the kids and it's very easy to get these drugs, which are legal drugs, but with a dreadful effect because addiction is much stronger and uh, the side effects are much more stronger and they are killing people. So we need a, a real, uh, but it's amazing that we haven't had a conversation in which we speak uh, as, as a whole, as a country, which drugs are causing which effects and what can happen to you and people they don't know. They, 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 they uh, are um, going to the streets and somebody in the streets, a pusher, is going to tell them uh, all the uh, health factors because there is no discussion for this. And I think legalization of some drugs is instrumental. Of course, it's impossible to legalize all of the drugs, and they are even some drugs that are already legalized, which are terrible, and you have to revise this. But the chemical industry, as you can imagine, the pharmaceutical industry is against it because there is a huge amount of money involved, as it was with the vaccines and with many other <coughs> things. So um, we have to fight this as well. And that, that, that's, that's another issue. But um, what is interesting is that there are a lot of solutions. I mean, you can be um, in despair because you say how many things we have to make. But the single fact that there are things that we can make, I think that's a proof of hope for all of us because there are things we can change. 
the governments are not addressing these issues, but there are many issues to be addressed. So there is a goal, and since there is a goal, there is hope. And well, with can... this optimism, I think, <laughs> I think we can we can say farewell. <laughs>